Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our very first Victor's Heroes Wolverines event. My name is David Thompson, and I have the privilege of serving as a fundraiser for Michigan's Office of University Development and its Office of Research. The purpose of our conversation today is to discuss the power of the University of Michigan's community to ameliorate and often solve real world problems through evidence-based research. We are especially mindful this week of the ongoing importance of this research mission to the world. During the next hour, we will hear from several leading University of Michigan researchers about their innovative solutions to problems caused by the coronavirus pandemic or COVID-19. To begin our time together, I would first like to introduce two great friends of the University of Michigan, Debbie and John Erb. The Erb family has a long legacy at the University of Michigan, beginning with John's parents, Fred and Barbara, who met here as students. Fred and Barbara's commitment to nurturing and supporting the environment through business and philanthropy led them to establish a joint program between the Ross School of Business and the School for Environment and Sustainability called the Frederick A. and Barbara M. Erb Institute for Global Sustainable Enterprise. John and Debbie continued this family commitment to real world solution making through the Herb Family Foundation where they both serve as board members. At the University of Michigan, John also serves on the President's Advisory Group, the Strategic Advisory Council for the Herb Institute, and the Advisory Board for the Graham Environmental Sustainability Institute. We are so fortunate to have them as part of the Michigan family. Welcome, John and Debbie. Thank you, David. John and I heard about the Vent Me project through my surgeon, Dr. Kyle Van Coovering. Dr. Kyle phoned me the evening of April 6th to apologize for having to reschedule my appointment with him the following day because he was working on a project to help the COVID-19 pandemic in which ventilators are split and that he got the go ahead to try this out on pigs. This did not come as a surprise to us as John and I already knew that he was more than a, clinic, a clinician and surgeon at U of M. He was also working with biomedical engineering on other projects. I was also on the call with Debbie and Dr. Kyle after hearing more about the project for retrofitting an existing ventilator to ventilate multiple patients simultaneously we became very intrigued and, and also that it had customized pressures. Well, that's why we really became intrigued. I explained my family's deep and long relationship with Michigan. Dr. Kyle had not known that prior. And I asked what we could do to help since we probably were in a position that we could provide some funding from the family foundation. We sent an email that evening to Maureen Martin, the Herb Family's development director at the university. And by 4.30 the next afternoon, we had all the details that we needed so we could act and support this project. It was truly serendipitous. Had, Kyle not call, had Dr. Kyle not called that night, we would have never heard about this project and he would have never have known that we might be in the position to help. We attribute the quick success of this project to the ingenuity of U of M faculty, along with the support to adapt quickly and bring solutions forward. And that comes under the leadership of Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan. As Vice President, Dr. Cunningham leads the Office of Research, whose mission is to catalyze, support, and safeguard U of M research. She has vast experience as a researcher, administrator, educator, and clinician including more than 20 years spent as an emergency medicine physician at U of M and Hurley Medical Center in Flint. She also directs the U of M Injury Prevention Center, established a national consortium to improve firearm safety, served as associate vice president for research health sciences and is former research chair for the U of M Department of Emergency Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you, Debbie and John. Without your support and the support of countless others across the University of Michigan, our researchers wouldn't be able to carry out their innovative and impactful work. 
the university adopted this vision of research to serve the world throughout the rapidly changing COVID-19 pandemic. It's evident that our U of M research community had really fully embraced this vision. The university ramped down non-critical laboratory research on March 20th in order to protect both the health and safety of our employees and also to preserve as much needed PPE uh, as possible for clinical care. One exception to the university-wide ramp down was COVID-related research that aimed to address immediate needs of the global pandemic. Researchers across a wide variety of disciplines at U of N immediately and gracefully shifted their focus toward COVID-19, working to identify diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics targeting the novel coronavirus. Our scientists are leading clinical trials to test the efficacy of certain treatments, and there's also a growing cohort of faculty who are exploring how COVID-19 affects specific populations. To further delineate this, we created a research index to increase awareness of the fostering collaboration across U of M researchers studying COVID-19. And as of this Monday, we've identified more than 270 research projects focused on the novel corona coronavirus and its impacts across society. We've received some good news from the state of Michigan on May 15th when Governor Gretchen Whitmer authorized the limited reopening of our laboratories. Research leadership from across U of M were prepared to safely reopen some labs and buildings across the Ann Arbor campus, which we did on May 21st. More than 700 researchers from six units have now returned to labs on the Ann Arbor campus in recent weeks. And next week, another 3,000 more will return. Uh, we have begun to safely ramp up activity as part of our pilot wave to re-engage research and scholarship. The return to work so far for research has proceeded smoothly with few health and safety uh, with sorry with new health and safety procedures implemented. Uh, today, in accordance with state regulations, we launched a second more expansive wave of research reengagement uh, that involves faculty and staff from 12 other units on the Ann Arbor campus. Thus, we expect over the never the next few weeks, uh, we will have reengaged our vast laboratory research portfolio. The health and safety of our employees in Paramount. And so we, continue, we will continue to collaborate with public health experts and monitor important safety metrics to determine the best path forward to continue our research and also protect our community. These are challenging times, but I'm confident in the generation of scientific knowledge will, will be across U of M will play a critical role as we work together to find solutions for the pandemic. At the forefront of this activity is our Center for Drug Repurposing, which is taking on the challenge of finding a drug previously approved by the FDA, or more likely a cocktail of several drugs, to battle COVID-19. Here to talk more about this innovative research is Dr. Johnny Sexton. Thank you, Dr. Penny. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today to tell you about this exciting story. So this was a very quick moving story and we, um, We've co conducted a research project over the last um, about 12 weeks um, that I'd like to tell you about. Um, so I'm, I'm um, the director for the new Center of Drug Repurposing. In, um, it, in October of, 20, uh, of 2019, we um, developed the infrastructure to do drug repurposing research. And uh, drug repurposing is really, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's really appropriate in, in, to address this pandemic. And really simply what it is, is just discovering new uses for approved drugs um, that provides the quickest possible trans translation from the bench side to the bedside. So what you see here is this is the, the clinical translational wheel. And between T0 here, which is basic research science that we do uh, at this university, uh, and then traversing this barrier to, um, to where we're investigating uh, new drugs in human beings often takes 10 years. And we just don't have that amount of time. Really what we're trying to do here is to, to find a uh, existing drug that we can repurpose to help stem the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and, and this will maybe give us enough time uh, so that uh, an appropriate vaccine can be developed. So um, I'm super excited to show you um, some images of, uh, of human cells that are infected with um, the novel coronavirus. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we obtained this virus from the Washington patient zero. So this was the first patient in the, uh, that was identified in the United States. And this virus was, uh, was made available by an NIH funded resource called BEI resource. And uh, I'm gonna show you a lot of images today of human cells that have been infected with the novel coronavirus. And what this is, is this is our in vitro model. This is our model at the bench for the viral infection in a human being. And what we set out to do was to evaluate, evaluate every single FDA approved drug. Uh, 
we're we're using imaging here to to uh, to determine efficacy for our our compounds, and uh, we collected about a million and a half images over the course of the last twelve weeks, and we had to leverage artificial intelligence, specifically machine vision, to help us go and inspect these images and detect where there's efficacy, and really our next steps are to evaluate these drugs in clinical trials and then extend our screening campaign to all of the clinical candidate drugs. These are drugs that have been entered into clinical trials but are not yet approved. So that's another exciting uh, expansion of this research. So uh, at the very beginning of March, we made a decision. We talked to, I talked with my colleagues that, uh, that, that run um, the Center for Drug Repurposing. We decided that this was a problem that we could tackle. We went on to implementation and that means uh, getting biosafety level three training uh, this training comes with a very nice outfit. It comes with a hazmat suit. So we have to do these experiments in, uh, in a very highly controlled, highly contained environment so that it's safe to the researchers and safe to the environment on the outside. We obtained the virus and then we developed our test. Now this test is a little different than uh, the test that you've been hearing about in the news or maybe a test that you've actually had. Those tests are, are to diagnose whether or not you've ha you have COVID-19. But what this test does is this test allows us to, to apply live virus to human cells to see if we can block that infection. So it's a little bit different. Um, and, and, and then this test allows us to investigate the impact of a drug and whether or not it can act as an antiviral. So what we did was we collected our, um, our, our set of FDA approved drugs. There were 1,400 drugs in our collection and uh, that are rapidly deployable where there's commercial supply. And we screened them all at five different concentrations. And so this was about 24,000 tests. Uh, we generated 15 terabytes of, of data and that's about 1.5 million images. So we've discovered some fantastic compounds that, uh, that we are now investigating for clinical translation. I just wanna, um, I just wanna say that that these are what we call in vitro results. So these, uh, we've demonstrated that these work in human cells, but we have not demonstrated that they work in human beings yet, uh, and, and, or if they're safe in human beings, but um, we will, uh, that's the next uh, phase for this project. So uh, I wanna highlight the team, the team, the team. Um, two people in specific who just did an amazing, amazing job who have given up 12 weeks of their life every single day, 16 hours a day, Carmen Mirabelli, and Jesse Wotrain. So Carmen is a PhD virologist in the Department of Microbiology, and Jesse is just a second year um, PhD student in medicinal chemistry. And um, so moving on, uh, I'm, I, so nobody's really ever seen images of infected cells like this. And what I'm showing you here is there are th three different images here. And these images are um, of the same area. And uh, what you can see in the cyan color here are, these are the nuclei of cells. And this magenta color is the viral infection. So what we've done is we've developed a test that can stain for the presence of a viral protein called the nucleocapsid protein. And uh, when we started investigating these images, we really saw an amazing amount of images. You know, as they say, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, this picture is worth more than a thousand data points. Uh, and what you can see is there are different kinds of, of, of cell infection uh, phenotypes here. So you can see small rounded up cells. You can see cells at early infection that have these philopodia that, that are sort of branching out. And this is how the infection spreads from cell to cell. So with, the, uh, with artificial intelligence uh, to help us interpret these images, we're able to, to detect when uh, a drug is intervening in that viral life cycle that may have therapeutic benefit for human beings. Um, and so just to give you a, a, a little, a, a three-dimensional view here. So one thing that's really interesting about a viral infection in these human cells is that they form what are called syncytia. So this is where a virus infects a cell, it infects its neighbors, and it pulls together into this large consolidated mass of cells that are infected. And, um, and so this is really the viral uh, factory for new virus production. And you can actually see that this cluster of cells is shedding viral particles and is surrounding in its surrounding area and in infecting um, in its neighboring cells. And in green here are lipid droplets. So that's the fat inside of a cell. All cells have some fat. 
And what we know is that the virus uses the fat as a fuel source uh, for replication. And so we were particularly interested in how uh, lipid biology is affected in, um, in this, uh, in the, in, in the in, in viral infection cycle, because we've got many drugs uh, that, that modulate those endpoints. Okay, so this is just a quick overview of our process. So uh, we, we take human cells and we put them into 384 well plates. So these 384 well plates, they allow us to do 384 tests in a very small area. And, uh, and so we, we deposit cells and then we pre-incubate them with drugs and then we infect and after we infect, we come back and we stain and we image them. And so this is, again, is another picture of virally infected cells. And our machine vision helps us to identify what those and where the infected cells are and to count them. And this is how we detect an antiviral effect here. So this is the antiviral effect goes up to 100%. That means absolutely uninfected. And through this process, we're also able to characterize the mechanism of action. This is really what we're after here. Number six a confirmed antiviral hit. Now these cells look like they're, they've not been infected and that's really the goal. So just to give you an example of that, um, you may have heard of a drug called remdesivir. So this is a drug um, that is, is just gaining FDA approval by a company named Gilead. And what it does, this is a repurposed drug. It was actually intended for Ebola and it inhibits one of the critical enzymes of the virus called the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And this is um, absolutely essential for the viral to replicate itself. So what this drug does is it inhibits replication of the virus. And when we started to inspect our images, we actually saw that there were remnants of viral staining as pointed out by these white arrows here. So this doesn't look uninfected, but this is still really good. This is a good situation. So the virus has entered the cell, but it's basically been shut down. So this is a, a, this is a good and, and very promising compound from our perspective. Um, I'm going to tell you about just a couple of, of drugs that, we, um, that, that we've uh, detected uh, with high efficacy that we're shifting gears into clinical translation now. One is actually not a drug, but an over-the-counter dietary supplement, and it's called, it's a protein called lactoferrin. And so uh, lactoferrin is a, a, a protein that exists in human beings, and it's in its highest concentration in colostrum breast milk. And what this does is this imparts um, antiviral and antibacterial effects from the mother through breast milk to the infant. And what you can see here is that in an untreated well, you see that classic magenta staining of the virus. And when we treat with lactoferrin, um, it, 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 just, it just absolutely goes away. So this is something that we're very interested in translating um, to the clinic. Um, two more drugs that are, were, were very interesting because of their safety profile um, is, uh, is metoclopramide and ipratropium bromide. So, Metoclopramide is a drug that is commonly prescribed for, for nausea and for gastroparesis. It's a safe drug, and it had an absolutely amazing effect as an antiviral. And ipratropium bromide also is um, highly efficacious in terms of its antiviral effect. And it is, um, uh, it's also widely used as a, as a bronchodilator, so it's used in asthma. So these are compounds that we're going to go investigate in, in the clinic. Um, so now, we're going to extend this effort to screening all of the 5,000 clinical candidates that we have. These are, these are uh, not drugs yet, but they're drugs in the making, and we know that they're safe. Um, we we uh, have a, a whole collection of, of compounds. We have over 7,000. We've already tested about 1,500. We have about um, 5,000 or 5,500 left to test here, and these are compounds that can be rapidly accelerated for development um, to address the COVID-19 um, epidemic. Uh, we're going to uh, work with the FDA to, to implement these in a safe manner so that we make sure we don't harm any patients and we can detect efficacy when it's there. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again for your attention and uh, uh, appreciate your uh, attention. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sexton, for leading this important research. And uh, you mentioned your team has worked really hard, but I also know that you have been putting in 16 and 18 hour days for weeks uh, uh, now on end, uh, working towards finding a solution uh, for all of us for, for COVID. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic has swept across the nation, a major concern was whether our nation's hospitals had enough ventilators to provide breathing support to critically ill patients. Uh, this was particularly near and dear to my heart as an emergency physician. 
U of M teams immediately got to work on a solution as we heard a little bit about in our entry. Dr. Kyle Vancouver is here to tell us a little bit more about it. Okay, can everybody hear me? Perfect. Good afternoon and thank you, Dr. Cunningham and, and uh, to the rest of the Michigan team for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Kyle Vancouvering and as uh, Debbie and John highlighted, I'm a head and neck surgeon here at U of M. Uh, and I wanna take a moment to speak about how we were able to rapidly mobilize our 3D printing team in a completely new direction to respond to the COVID pandemic. I have a couple of brief disclosures that I want to mention. Uh, I help run a 3D printing lab here at the University of Michigan that primarily focuses on device development and patient specific uh, medical applications. And we have several patents that have come through that work uh, and have even started a small 3D printing company. Uh, but most importantly, the VentMe project that I want to talk about today was developed in response to the COVID pandemic. And I, I think it's really important to highlight that during this pandemic, the Food and Drug Administration mobilized something called an emergency use authorization. That is not a formal FDA approval, but rather a more limited authorization for use, sale, and distribution during the pandemic uh, with a little bit less rigidity in the authorization process while still maintaining high focus on safety. And really the most important disclosure from all of this is that this process really required an enormous team effort for the development. So normally our 3D printing lab focuses on translational engineering. That is making anatomic specific products for use in patients and in training. This may range from a surgical guide for use in the operating room during reconstruction uh, to a patient specific tumor model to help educate the patient on where their tumor is located. We make several training models to teach young residents and trainees how to perform procedures and tracheostomy and airway related devices, specific uh, skull based reconstruction devices and even tissue engineering constructs for recreating ears. But when the coronavirus pandemic hit, everything changed for our research and even the great research that we're involved with on our lab normally really paled in comparison to the devastation of the, of the virus. People were being forced and urged to stay at home as the economy faced globally a downturn in a way that we've never seen with projections requiring years for us to recover. The world really shut down. And amidst this, we saw devastating outbreaks of the virus across the world with countless deaths in a way that we've never seen before as healthcare systems were overrun both nationally and internationally. And so two months ago, there was enormous uncertainty about the future of the virus and what would be coming. Our own Michigan medicine projections had predicted that our healthcare system was going to be overrun beyond its capacity. We were mobilizing to create an overflow hospital called a field hospital. And there was a fair bit of uncertainty about what trajectory this virus was going to take. Even with our maximal efforts at social distancing, we really didn't know what was coming. Our team really wanted to help. And while we were chipping in to help centralize resources and create face shields, perhaps the biggest concern was the ventilator shortage that we were likely going to be facing. Ventilators were going to be a huge limitation, so much so that the federal government actually mobilized wartime footing in order to have major manufacturers create ventilators. And I thought this was a great investment from a federal standpoint, but the problem was the lead time for auto industry manufacturers to create ventilators was going to take weeks, if not months. And that delay was going to miss a key portion of the rise in the pandemic. So we looked for a way to intervene in, in a potentially more rapid fashion. One of the things that had come to light was the opportunity of sharing ventilators, taking one ventilator to ventilate multiple patients as a way to distribute and maximize resources. So how do you really split a ventilator? This is something that I had to learn on the fly. It turns out that fundamentally speaking, it's not particularly difficult. 
with a couple tubes and connectors that allow you to split uh, one tube into two, you can actually hook up multiple patients to a ventilator. And at one point in time, several years ago, there was some very preliminary research that showed it may be safe and feasible. However, the problem with splitting a ventilator is that each patient gets the exact same support. They receive the same pressure, the same rate of ventilation, the same amount of oxygen in each breath. And while that may work initially when two patients are equally sick and equally sized, as one patient gets better or another patient gets worse, the need for ventilator support changes in each patient and overventilating or underventilating one patient can be significantly harmful. So the solution is to find a way to individualize the ventilation to each patient. And the real focus here is to individualize the pressure that you're providing to each patient. As one lung gets healthier, it can ventilate more safely at lower pressures. And so we went straight to the drawing board and you, hear, you see here I have actually my very first diagrams on how a ventilator works, how some of these filters and tubings are designed and a splitter design that would theoretically allow me to take one tube, convert it to two and put little valves in there to potentially control the pressure. So we fired up the 3D printer and very quickly we're able to create a design to split the ventilator to multiple patients, one, in, one inlet, two outlets, with these little tabs that would allow you to theoretically control the pressure. And I thought, man, could it really be that simple? So we took it the next day to the operating room, borrowed a ventilator, tested it out, and it wouldn't be researched without some failure. And uh, it turns out it's not at all this simple. So I went back to the drawing board and started thinking about how do you really regulate pressure? What is a real pressure regulator? And we were able to draw a little inspiration from scuba divers. It turns out, in fact, that the highly pressurized air in a scuba tank at over 3,000 PSI is very tightly regulated to normal air pressures when you're breathing it through your regulator. And so back to the drawing board I went, designing some modifications to conventional scuba gear and making it work for human pressures. Here is my sketch for the very first pressure regulator back on March 24th. And within a day, we had created formal engineering drawings and it actually created a list of parts and designed our 3D products. We again fired up the 3D printers and had our whole system components printed individually. We had to work through several challenges about how to actually assemble these, but we made our first pressure regulator. And with the addition of a spring from a ballpoint pen and a piece of a rubber glove, you can actually see it here in one of my first prototypes, we had a functional system. I took it back to the anesthesia lab and uh, sure enough, this seemed to be working. And it just so happened that one of my partners had a friend whose dog was in some desperate need of dental cleaning. And we talked to the family and they were gracious enough to allow us to connect our regulator to the dog while under anesthesia and prove that we really have something here. And uh, with a little bit of uh, luck and ingenuity, we were really onto something. So we called Kristen Wolf at Tech Transfer at U of M. And she very rapidly helped us mobilize an amazing team of developers and business people, uh, which you can see here. We had incredible support from the Herb family, which was instrumental in the process. And we partnered with a great manufacturing company that it's actually a medical manufacturer out of Grand Rapids called AutoCam Medical. And together, we were able to take this drawing that I had sketched out in my homemade notebook on March 24th to a first functional prototype that was then used in dogs, subsequently in pigs, as uh, Debbie and John mentioned, for a large animal trial. And partnering with our manufacturing partner, we had a polished, finalized medical device ready to go. We put this rapidly through testing from April 10th to April 14th, and by April 19th, in less than a month time, we had FDA emergency use authorization for distribution and sale across the United States. This really could not have happened without, well, several weeks of sleepless nights, but more importantly, an incredible collaborative team effort from people all across the university. And it really can't happen anywhere else other than a place like U of M.
I'm really proud to say, honestly, in spite of all the effort that we put into this, that we really have not needed to use these vent splitting technologies or the VentMe system in the United States, at least not yet, and I'm hopeful it stays that way. But the future remains uncertain here in the US, but with more certainty, we know that internationally in developing nations where the resources are less available, there's a huge need for this type of product. So we've partnered with several distributors and we are actively sending devices to Brazil, Peru, Chile, Pakistan, and actively looking for other places to send this device so it could help as many people as possible. And with that, I wanna say thank you guys so much for your time and go blue. Thank you, Dr. Vancouverine, for using your expertise and your energy uh, to address this challenge. You know, I, I just wanna highlight before we move on to our next speaker that the timeline that you laid out there is, is of the amount of work that was done in that short amount of timeline. Um, is not only breathtaking, but also doesn't account for uh, you also having to make the same tremendous changes all of us had to make in April and March for your own personal life and the rest of your work, which all of a sudden didn't suddenly go away. Uh, and instead, you, uh, you like many of our researchers across, the, uh, across U of M, focused uh, intently on, on how to find a solution. And, and for that, we are most grateful. Um, and here, I, I want to hear, talk a little bit more. Scientists worldwide uh, have been working to identify people who have been infected with the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And uh, to tell you more a little bit of our work in that space is Dr. Janet Smith. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, a three-group project at UM to um, develop antibody tests for um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, I am the uh, faculty member in the Department of Biological Chemistry in the Michigan Medical School, and also with a lab in the Life Sciences Institute. And today I'm speaking to you as uh, the director of the Center for Structural Biology, which is located in the Life Sciences Institute. So, I thought I would tell first a little bit about what are we testing when we do diagnostic tests on patients. There are two fundamental kinds of tests. One asks or answers the question, is this person infected with the virus? And in order to do that, um, we need to find virus molecules in the patient in places where the virus lives. That is like, these are the, those horrible nose samples and throat and mouth samples. And they can be um, examined for the presence of the genome of the virus, which happens to be RNA. And that's a test that's very accurate, a bit slow and rather expensive. We can also look for protein molecules um, that the virus sheds. And that, those tests can be quicker, but they are a lot less sensitive than the, than the genome test. Um, but they can answer questions like, should this person be treated or quarantined? Should their contacts be traced? Um, the kind of tests that we're talking about are tests for antibodies. And we look for antibodies in the blood. Has this person been infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the uh, COVID-19 disease? Um, these are really important questions to answer because we'd like to know if a person is likely to be immune to a subsequent infection by the virus. Um, we'd also like to know how good their antibodies are if they have them. Could they be used to treat other sicker patients? And on a more population level, um, it's very important, particularly we're all concerned now about whether there'll be a second wave. If they're immune, how long does that immunity last? How does the virus spread through a population? These are things that we just don't know yet about um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So here's how these antibody tests are done. We, ooh, uh, we um, bait a plate. This is uh, not like the ones that Dr. Sexton showed, but this is a 96 well plate, fits in the palm of your hand. And 96 different patient samples can be tested at the same time. And we put a bait in each of these little wells, um, which is a highly purified protein that's made by the, the protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, 
And then to each of these little wells, we add the, a sample of serum from one patient. And this way the test is set up, we, what, what we want to know is which, whose serum took the bait, whose serum has the antibodies. And that is set up to give a color. So the darker the color means there's a better antibody, a stronger antibody response. It could be either the antibodies are better or they're at higher concentration. So this is the kind of thing that the test that is testing for antibodies. Um, it's really important for this to, to be a useful test that it's a very specific for the virus of SARS-CoV-2 and not some ordinary coronavirus that gives a common cold. We don't want false positives. We want to know about this particular virus. And so it's very important that this protein that we use as the bait on here is, is um, highly pure. And it also needs to be something for which there are very, very likely to be antibodies if a person has ever been infected. And that means the protein needs to be abundant. So here is um, everybody's favorite picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which I am sure that most of you have seen. Um, the, the, a very abundant and prominent protein is the characteristic spike on the virus, on the surface of the virus, these little red spikes that give it coronavirus, their name of corona. Um, and that's what we use as the bait for the antibody tests that we've been developing. This is, a, again, like everybody else has talked to you about today, is a very highly collaborative project um, between the uh, Center for Structural Biology and the Life Sciences Institute, and we are the protein specialists. We are, we study protein structure um, for our ordinary research, and we really know how to make good, pure proteins. This uh, Department of Pathology's uh, clinical core lab has provided validation for the tests. And then the, in the School of Public Health, the Department of Epidemiology is, is going to distribute these test kits, which can be used in clinics here, but um, will also be uh, sent to uh, Latin American countries. So I want to, I have to tell you something about protein. I love proteins. Um, in this picture, this um, artist rendering, we see a, a virus particle here in the bottom left-hand corner with a spike protein sticking out of it. And then at the top in sort of green color is a human cell that could be infected by the virus. The spike protein is really important for the for infectivity of the virus because a part of it, the little yellow part, uh, makes a very specific contact with a protein that's on the surface of our cells. Protein's name is ACE2. And this contact is responsible for getting this entire virus particle incorporated inside the human cell that is causing the infection. There's some amazing structural changes that occur to the spike protein that allow that to happen. Antibodies, here's an antibody over here, with, with um, its two combining sites that interact with whatever it is an antibody to, surveilling around for inf um, pathogens that may have infected. And so what we would like to do is to make very, very pure spike protein to use as a, uh, to find out if people have antibodies. So what are we actually doing? Here's the spike protein. We are making two things. We're making the whole protein that you see here, and we're also making just the yellow bit, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. The way we do that is to take DNA that encodes one or the other of them. We use it with, we, we expose it to human cells that are growing in a soup, a culture broth. Uh, we let the, DNA go into the cells, we wait for a few days to have biology take its course. Um, the proteins that are made are secreted into the broth. A few days later, we harvest that broth, we purify the protein, we make it really, really pure, either the spike, the whole spike, or just the receptor binding domain. We check its integrity. You can see spikes here in this negative stain electron micrograph. Um, and then we transfer the purified proteins to the public health and, and pathology people. And 
Um, here is um, a little bit of data. Here's, here's this ELISA plate again. This is the test plate. Every single one of these little spots is one experiment, one result from one patient sample. And then here on the left it are it, um, some data plotted. So every point on here is telling us what the antibody, how strong was the antibody response from this patient this many days after they first had symptoms of uh, COVID-19. And all of these are these, so the lines connect the data points for one patient. And, you, and there are plots on here for 11 different patients who were hospitalized patients at, in the UM hospital with COVID-19. And so already you can see from this, first of all, the antibody doesn't come immediately after symptoms. It's a little bit delayed, sometimes by actually many days. Um, but it rises rapidly, it gets to a high level, and at the time this experiment was done, th this, this experiment was done, um, they were, levels were still high and the experiment is ongoing. This is really important information, but it's a very special subset of infected people because these people were in the hospital, so you know they were really sick. Um, what we would like to know is what about people who had no symptoms but were infected or had only very mild symptoms? Um, and you know, we need this information for the clinical core lab is working all that out and then we're gonna have the antibody tests go forward. And then as everyone else has said, this was a very big collaborative project and many people worked really hard. Um, in the epidemiology department, Aubrey Gordon is a faculty member who pulled this group together. Um, and the proteins were made by uh, our group in the Center for Structural Biology who have been working every day uh, since we, Aubrey contacted us on right after we shut down. So I believe it was March 22nd or 23rd. Um, and we handed off the first protein on April 7th to um, the epidemiology department and also to John Jacario's group in the clinical core lab in the pathology department. <clears throat> we have been, uh, are being supported in this effort by an organization known as Open Philanthropy, and also by two UM alums, Debbie Klatskin and Bert Sukur, who have provided generous support for this research. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you about this project. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Vice President Cunningham. Thank you so much for your leadership in this uh, unprecedented time for the world, the University of Michigan. We know that you are um, balancing a lot. This is a $1.6 billion research enterprise, the largest public research university in the country. Thank you. And Dr. Vancouver and Dr. Sexton, Dr. Smith, thank you for your presentations. Now I'll be asking questions from our guests. Uh, we have a few questions that have come in already. I would encourage uh, those of you that are listening to um, uh, ask further questions through the Q&A bar. And um, I will try to get through as many as I can in the remaining time. Um, with a few minutes before five, we'll close. Um, uh, just a, a few comments. There may be a few questions about subjects uh, not related to research and we'll give priority to those that are related to research because of the subject matter today. Thank you. So for the first question, um, there's a question about, have there been any in vitro virus cases and how did the VETUS do? Um, Dr. Sexton, is that a question for you? Sure, yeah. I, um, we we um, generally don't talk about specific patients um, when, we're, when we're discussing um, uh, medical outcomes. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that uh, two of the most protected classes of people are pregnant women and, and infants. Uh, there was a study published, we're happy to provide the link to it. Um, they're, they're nearly virtually asymptomatic, which is really interesting. So I'm not aware of any, um, of, of any cases of, of, uh, of, of fetal death or, um, or serious complications in pregnant women. Um, they're of, uh, the, the, the study that, that we've seen had about um, 40 uh, pregnant women um, 
out of, it was about 10 or 15% of the whole maternity ward uh, was COVID-19 positive. And of those, only one or two of the patients had any symptoms whatsoever. And so it's, it's a very interesting thing in terms of the, the, the pathophysiology of COVID-19 is that, is that pregnant women and infants are highly protected. And uh, th this is a, a, an interesting opportunity for drug discovery as well. If we can figure out what those factors are that are protecting uh, the, the mothers and the infants, then uh, it leads to a, an opportunity for intervention. Thank you. While we have you here, um, what do you think is a realistic timeline to expect for a vaccine for COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, so uh, I'm not a vaccine development expert, but um, uh, if, if we had a vaccine in 18 months, I think it would be remarkable. There have been some um, early mRNA-based vaccine um, trials going on that seem promising. It's a fairly, it's a new technology for a coronavirus, um, but uh, vaccine development routinely and at, at maximum speed takes generally 18 months if everything goes perfectly. And if it doesn't, if they don't work, then you know it can be an extended time frame. Which is why we're really focused on finding uh, drugs that can help ameliorate um, the severity of COVID-19, even, even if it's not a cure. We just want to keep patients out of acute respiratory distress. We want to keep them out of the cytokine storm that does all that multi-organ system damage. And so um, that's what our focus has been on, is to try to find drugs that can bridge that gap. And another interesting thing that we're doing is we're not just trying to find a drug, but we're strategically combining drugs into cocktails. We know that works so well for HIV and for hepatitis C so that those diseases are really effectively managed now. So that's another aspect of our research that we're really excited about is to try to, um, is to, try to rationally combine the drugs that we've seen and, uh, and into a, a more highly efficacious um, cocktail. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Smith, uh, when will researchers know whether the antibodies are protective? Well, that's gonna take time. <laughs> Um, and uh, in humans, it's, it's not an experiment that one can do. Um, although some people, some individuals have, uh, with antibodies have volunteered um, to uh, be exposed to the virus. Um, I don't think any of study like that would go forward, but that's something that we need to um, examine on a population level. There's an interesting experiment going on in Germany, and I think these will be more, I guess what you call retrospective results where they're um, testing uh, households of people who are apparently healthy over a very long, monthly, over a very long period of time to find out where they're testing for antibodies to find out who, who has developed immunity and where they are. And then if you follow it at a population level over a long period of time, um, then you will get an answer to that question. But one of the frustrating things about uh, the coronavirus pandemic is that there is so much we don't know about this virus. The, as a scientist, the basic science of this uh, coronavirus is fascinating. It's very much more complicated than many other viruses that we know a lot more about. But uh, because it's been a fairly obscure area, of virology, um, it, there hasn't been a lot of funding and that's not anybody's fault. Um, you know, the pandemic that m most people were worried about was flu. Um, and so there's been tremendous amount of research in, the, in, in influenza virus. And it's been actually, a, a lot of the advances that have been made in corona virology have come from the flu community rapidly pivoting to work on, um, on SARS-CoV-2. And we're gonna have, it'll be analogous to how things were with HIV 30 years ago. There'll be a lot of information uh, coming in the next few years and we'll have answers to many of these questions. But right now we just don't know. It's um, understood that approximately 4% of the ICU patients that are being discharged have had to be readmitted. Um, do we have, um, any sort of evidence-based uh, research to say why that is and if we looked at their antibody production? I have no idea whether, I'm sure somebody's looking at, at antibody production. I don't know, I'm not a clinician. Um, Dr. Cunningham might be able to answer that question about 
the reason for readmission, I mean, I would guess it's because they went home too soon. Dr. Cunningham, do you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> So uh, I, I, I can't off the top of my head give the exact reasons and I see, I see the question in the, in the chat here. So there's a lot of reasons why separate from people going home um, too soon, which I, I trust our clinicians are, are not doing, um, but there's uh, you know, a host of other risk factors which uh, cause people to be at higher risk, elucidating which of those people actually do worse after they go home or not. Uh, there's still work to be done there and I don't have a clear answer for, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Van Kuvering, um, what is the typical development timeline for healthcare equipment and testing? Is it possible for University of Michigan's experience with the rapid design pressure regulator to change any of this? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think something like this kind of a pressure regulator would probably, in the absolute best case scenario, take about three years to develop by the time you run it through all of the uh, phases of testing and authorization through formalized FDA processes. Uh, I think our experience doing this in, you know, a five-year timeline in less than five weeks was remarkable and it taught us a lot about how to work with the FDA and to work collaboratively building and it was a back and forth thing of, hey, can you check this real quick for us? Hey, we just found this out. Can we modify this? Um, and it really changed the landscape of how we kind of worked through this process and how we worked as a team uh, to build that. So I, I think and actually I, I hope that we continue to leverage this experience to move forward even if and when the coronavirus pandemic settles out and we're back to a more traditional regulatory workflow. I hope the channels of communication have been opened interdisciplinary and uh, with the FDA by this whole experience. Thank you. Vice President uh, Cunningham, Washington County's per capita death rate for those with coronavirus seems significantly lower than other counties across Michigan. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, David, so for, for Washtenaw County, um, I think there's two things. One, um, we're learning a lot about the health disparities that are involved in, in this disease. Um, and so some of those death rates, I think, reflect, um, uh, reflect the sociodemographics of Washtenaw County uh, compared to other places in the state. But uh, I think the larger answer is uh, with a big thank you to our community. Um, we sheltered in place very effectively. Um, we socially distanced, we wore our masks. Um, and the, uh, the take up of that public health advice was very strong in our county. And with it, we, we, we did definitely reap some of the benefits of uh, lower rates of death later on. Thank you. Um, is it possible um, to scale up testing both active virus and antibodies so that people can test themselves at home on a regular basis at an affordable cost? That would be wonderful. That's a goal. Um, the, the test, the antibody test that I described is a, is a, is a lab test. Um, it could be developed. In fact, it has been developed, although not particularly reliably for the initial commercial products as a, um, what's called a point of care test. It could be done quickly um, in a doctor's office. Um, and I don't know about doing those at home but definitely in a doctor's office. Thank you very much. Um, Vice President Cunningham, this is a question for you about the um, strategic importance of the University of Michigan's research enterprise in a time of uh, a global public health crisis like this. Can you speak to why uh, the research mission of the University of Michigan matter so much? Yeah, sure, David. So um, uh, our, research, our research enterprise is tremendous and incredibly diverse uh, portfolio, both uh, with the portfolio that we see here today, you know, very biomedical and focused on really, you know, immediate and life-saving components, um, all, all the way across to areas of the campus that are looking at um, uh, research on how uh, social distancing and sheltering in place is affecting our lives and our, and our, 
our parenting and our schooling and our children. Um, we're looking at all of those different aspects and the ability to pivot the, the a research university. It, one of the amazing pieces of it is sort of demonstrated by this group of researchers today is they had busy jobs focusing on something else entirely. We're not focused on COVID specifically uh, five months ago. Um, and we're able to rapidly pivot, which is what researchers and research universities can do, nimbly and rapidly pivot to focus on a new problem, uh, shift resources uh, and ideas, mobilize bright young minds to draw things on pads of paper, um, uh, uh, as Dr. Van Covering did, um, and then use the immense infrastructure that we have here to move that forward in, in just weeks. That, that type of ingenuity and creativity and flexibility of innovation uh, is, is a hallmark of, of the research enterprise and, and why uh, the type of work that's done uh, in, at research universities is so paramount, uh, both to the, the education of our students and the future of our, as we learn, you know, our economics will depend in our country on how the virus does and how the virus does partly depends on how quickly we respond to it with science. And science is generated at a fundamental level by basic research universities. So a really important time. Thank you very much. Um, we have come to the end of our time and I wanna say once again, um, thank you to uh, Vice President Cunningham, uh, to Dr. Sexton, Vancouver Ian and Smith for sharing your research with us. It's so great to hear right from the source about the exciting work that's underway at the University of Michigan. And this is an important um, aspect of giving us hope for the future. I wanna thank especially Debbie and John Erb for serving as our host today. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for joining us on our first Victors Heroes Wolverines event. We appreciate you letting us try something new and staying connected during this time. You'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this event, a survey and slides from today. Please do fill out the information so we can keep you informed about upcoming sessions. Stay well, stay safe, and thank you again. Go Blue.